Hello, so this is your unit 1.2 and 1.3 review. Um, so please uh, use this to check yourself. You should not be explicitly copying, but checking yourself. So question one, it says you take public transportation from a stop near your home to a nearby park. The park is about three and, and three and four tenths miles away and your trip on the public transportation takes approximately 19 minutes. The following graph represents the number of minutes since you started your trip to the park and the correspondence distance from home. So from here to here, and it's over a span of 19 minutes, okay? Um, well, approximately 19 minutes, right? And yeah, so. It wants us to identify an interval of time over which the rate of change is positive and explain why, what a positive rate of change represents the situation. Then we're gonna identify an interval of time over which the rate of change is negative and explain what a negative rate of change represents in this situation and then identify a time when the rate of change is constant, okay? So examples that we're looking for, uh, and this can vary from here to here for A and B, it's that your, uh, from 10 minutes to 14 minutes. If I chose to do that, the rate of change is positive, right? So if I go 10 minutes to two, four, to 14 minutes, just right here, that is a positive rate of change, right? Um, and that means that this represents my distance from home is increasing while I'm taking public transportation to the park, right? I'm going faster away from home, okay? On B, identify an interval time over which the rate of change is negative. So I chose from 60 minutes to 65 minutes. So from 60 minutes to 65 minutes, the rate of change is negative. And this represents that my distance from home is decreasing while I'm taking public transportation. So I'm getting closer and returning home, correct? Next, on the identify a constant interval. Constant, let me go back. Um, I am on a constant interval. It looks like from here all the way to here, right? So from about 29 minutes to 60 minutes, the rate of change is constant. This represents my distance from home is not changing while I'm at the park. So this is while I'm at the park hanging out. So these are examples of what you should be looking. Again, your intervals should not be exactly mine because uh, there's other intervals you can choose and your words and your reason should be in your own. Okay, on question two, we're now looking at a table that shows gas prices in the United States. Um, there are four things that we're gonna observe here. What was the average rate of change in the price of gas from 2010 to 2014? What was the average rate of change in price of gas from 2010 to 2015? And what um, what does the two average rates of change tell you about gas prices in the United States between 2010 and 2015? And assume that the average rate of change from 2011 to 2012 continues through 2025. What would you predict the price of gas to be in 2025? So the first thing here is we're gonna do the price of gas from 2010 to 2014. So if you notice from 2010 to 2015, our price of gas for 2010 was $2.84. Our price of gas in 2014 was $3.42. So our average rate of change is our change in our Y over our change in our X, right? So that's what we're calculating. And we get about 145,000 of a cent per year, right? We're gonna do the same thing here. In 2010, it still was $2.84. In 2015, it was $2.51. So we had a little, so here, if we analyze from 2010 to 2015, it looks like that there was a drop in our gas, right? However, it says, what does these two average rates tell us between uh, from 2010 and 2015? Well, um, the 2010 to 2014 tells us that our prices were increasing by 14 and a half cents per year, right? And that between 2010 and 2015, the price decreased tells us that it was on an average of six um, and six cents of a cent per year. The average rates of this change tell two different stories depending on the year and the intervals and the calculations, which we talked about when we did our um, Super Bowl analysis, is that what years you choose will choose the narrative of your average rate of change, okay? So when I compare the two average rates of change, 
I could also conclude that between 2014 and 2015, there is a significant decrease in price, okay? That decrease was between 2014 and 2015, not from 2010 to 2015, okay? Because if we go back and look at the table, or, or 2015, um, these prices were slightly decreasing, but it didn't decrease as as fast as it did between these two prices, okay? All right. On four, it says, assume that the average rate of change continued, right? So if I'm going to continue, then I'm now looking at the prices from, I'm gonna first find the average rate of change from 2011 to 2012. So in 2012, gas was $3.69. And 2011, gas was $3.58. And so when I find the average rate of change, it's an 11 cent increase between those two years. So if this was to continue, um, I would expect a total of how much increase? Well, in order to find that 13, that 13, this 13 represents how far we've gone from 2012 to 2015, right? And that's gonna be a 13 year gap. And every year we've added 11 cents on. So that's why it's being multiplied and you're getting $1.43, okay? 369 represents what the gas price was in 2012. And if we continue the, the rate of increase, our average rate of change here, it's gonna be 369 plus that 13 years of increase, which is gonna result in $5.12, all right? Now we're on to... Question three, on question three, um, we have our piecewise function. And this is the longest part of our thing is just making sure we can read and interpret the piecewise, right? So it should be pretty lengthy. Um, this piecewise is made up of three intervals. So from neg when X is less than greater than or equal to negative two, but less than three, we're using the exponential function two to the X, okay? And I tried to give you all three examples of functions that we have been talking about since the start of the school year because they don't go away. So this one is an exponential, right? Here we have a linear, which is when X is greater than or equal to three, but less than nine. So we have a linear, hope oh, that got weird. And then here, when X is greater than or equal to nine, but less than or equal to 15, we have a quadratic. These are the three forms of functions we've been working with since the start of school. All right, it says construct a table of values for the function over the interval um, from when X is greater than or equal to negative two, but less than or equal to 15. So from start to finish, okay? What is the value of f of zero? When we're looking for the value of f of zero, that means that x equals zero. So we're looking for when does x equal zero? Okay, x equals zero, that's our y-intercept, okay? Next, it says, um, what is the value of f of three? Which is, which piece of the function should you use to determine that? Well, f of three means we're looking for when x equals three. And if we look at our intervals right here, we know that we would be using piece number two, because that's when x is equal to three, right? So we're going to be using interval number two to determine that. Okay, then it says for what values or values of the domain is f of x equal to 10 and show the work leading. So we're looking for when does y equal 10, okay? Looking for when y equals 10 isn't as easy as looking for um, just directly. You're gonna have to either do some graphing or do a little bit of manipulation with your equations and solve by hand if you wanna be you know, extra fancy. Um, but I would use a graphing calculator to determine here. But you're asking yourself, when does y equals 10? So essentially you're setting each piece of this equation equal to 10. If you have your, once you create your graph, you will already find one of your solutions. And so once you figure out where these equal 10, you then have to determine if those X values fall on these intervals, set intervals, okay? And it says, which value of function, um, value or values of the domain, F of X equals zero, 
So now we're looking for when y equals zero, which means that we're looking for our x-intercepts. We have any x-intercepts for the function, okay? So these are the things that you're gonna be doing for all the different parts. So here, so here is a possible table you could have created. So if you create it, um, so this is a possible table you could have created constructing from negative two to 15. You could have just started at negative two and went on to 15. You could have duplicated some values. I just went from negative two all the way to 15. And I did not repeat any values. Um, I only did my values where they're equal to, okay? And I say this because here, I'm only going to find the value of three, not on this interval, but on the second interval. I'm only going to find the value of nine on this interval, not on the second interval, because the value here of nine is irrelevant. The value here of three is irrelevant, because that's not where x is equal. So I've created my table of possible values, and now I'm going to use them as much as I can. Okay, from my tables, I now can create a graph. So notice I have my exponential curve. I have my linear curve, and then I have my quadratic curve, right? So I'm exponentially growing here. It's a linear increase here, and then it's the decrease half of a quadratic, okay? So from this graph, I can clearly see that I have a y-intercept. I have what looks like an x-intercept, which makes sense because 15 is zero. So I have an x-intercept, and I can describe other points along the way, okay? So it says, what is the value of f of zero? Which piece of the function should you use to determine f of zero? And as we talked about, f of zero means that you're looking for your y-intercept, okay? So f of zero is when x equals zero, and that fell on our first piece of the function, which is two to the x. So when we go look here, and I go to f of zero, I get one. So the answer would be um, one when x equals zero. Okay, next this is, what is the value of three? Which piece of the function do you use? So again, I'm going to three. I either can go to the table, go to three and I get eight, or I can go here to my graph, go to three and I get eight. And it says, which piece of the function did I use? I use the second piece, my linear function. And I that's how I get the value of eight because it's the linear function piece. Okay, now this f of 10 is where it gets tricky. So when you're finding f of 10, again, that means you're setting each one of them equal to 10, okay? So the values of the domain for which f of x equal, equal 10, there's a shortcut to it. I can go back to the graph and I'm asking myself, when does the function, if I go to 10, at what points do I hit, right? So that's what I'm looking for. At what values do I hit? 10. Okay. I'm trying to make my, my line as straight as possible. We all know I struggle with straight lines. So. Um, so I'm looking at when do I hit 10? Well, when I'm looking here, I have 10 on this interval and I have 10 on this interval, right? So I would be using my second interval and my third interval is where I'm solving at. Okay. The second interval is really obvious. It's when x equals, so I'm here at 10 at x equals six, right? My third interval isn't quite obvious. I know it's more than 11, but less than 12. So I would actually have to calculate, okay? So let's go see how this is calculated. So keeping in mind what intervals I'm using. So if you look right here, if you look right here, um, using the first interval, we have 2 thirds x plus 6 equals 10. I'm going to subtract 6. When I subtract 6 from both sides, I end up with, so we subtract 6 from both sides, cancel that out. I'm left with 4. Then I'm going to multiply by the reciprocal, and the reciprocal of 2 thirds is 3 halves. When I multiply by the reciprocal, that cancels this out, and I'm left with x equals 6, which, again, we can tell from the table and from the graph. This is just now algebraically representing why x equals 6 is for this. So we now know that f of 6 equals 10. Okay? Now we're going to do the same thing here. On this one, I actually went ahead and did the quadratic formula, um, but you do not have to do the quadratic formula. You actually can just graph. So here, 
And the main thing is that I need to make sure that my one side is equal to zero. In order to solve any quadratic, it has to be equal to zero. So we subtract 10. And when I subtract 10 from both sides, it became this. So with this equation, I can now go to the graph and look and see where does it cross the x-axis and which value fits into my into my function, I mean, into my interval on my function. So I'm going to go over here. I'm going to, well, let me graph it first so that one third x squared x squared plus 6x minus 25. Okay. So I'm going to bring this graph over so you can see what I'm doing. So if you look here, I now have my graph and clear all this out. So now on the graph, I see that it crosses zero at six and a half and it crosses zero at 11 and 449 thousandths, right? So this right here, I have to now think about what are my intervals? So for the quadratic, when we had our intervals, let's go back to our interval for a quadratic, it has to be between nine and 15 because it has to be between nine and 15, that discredits this value, right? This can't possibly be it. However, this guy is, okay? This is our interval. This fits in our interval. So therefore the other place where our function equals 10 is at 11 and 449 thousandths, okay? Now, as you can see here, I went ahead and did the, the quadratic, quadratic formula for that and still resulted in the same thing. But if you have the ability and option to use your calculator, then this is where graphing will be handy. If you want to refresh the quadratic formula, that's your x equals negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac divided by 2a. Okay. And all I did was plug in what the variables were. My a, not variables, my coefficients, a, b, and c. Okay. And then evaluate it. All right. So there's that. Um, on that part. Now it says, um, your conclusion, it says for the value of, uh, for what value of the function f of x equals zero? So the work is leading to your answer. So here you're looking for f of x equals zero. And we talked about, that means that you're looking for your x-intercept, right? And we can tell in multiple places what our x-intercept is. From the graph, we know that our x-intercept is at we know that our x-intercept is at 15. From the table, we can see that our x-intercept is at 15. We have two representations already telling us what our x-intercept is. So the last and final one would be for us to solve the quadratic formula function, I mean, solve the quadratic using the quadratic formula. Or again, now you're going to go back to your graph. And this time we're going to keep it at 15. And we're looking for when does it cross the x-axis? Well, it crosses at three and it crosses at 15, right? We can't use three because this is outside of our interval, our third interval. However, 15 is within our third interval. So again, either one is going to work and get the job done. So we end up with that our x-intercept is x equals 15. And yeah. All right, so don't forget to make and bring your standard size note card if you choose to and turn in your review for extra credit. Remember, reviews must be completed to receive the full extra credit. No partial credit will be given. Good luck and let me know if you have any questions. Thank you.